Hello, I'm LVD and welcome to another episode of The Joy of Deck Building. Thank you for allowing us into your home as we try to maybe turn this into a weekly series. Your comments on the previous episode truly warmed my heart. And don't forget to leave your suggestions and ideas for future videos in the comments below. Today I thought we'd take a look at the new raccoons from Bloomborough. I love these rascals with their grubby little hands, and there are quite a few decent payoffs for including them in your deck. Now I've already prepped the canvas where we are building the deck. On your screen you will also see some of the most popular meta decks at the moment. These are good to keep in mind when building a new deck, as it might inform some of your deck building choices. Now since we are building a raccoon deck, the easiest place to start is just by taking a look at all cards that seem to mention raccoons, either as their creature type or cards that may refer to raccoons in their text box. Now once you get a little bit more familiar with all these cards, I also recommend zooming out so you've got uh, more cards on one screen, it will make it a little bit faster to put your deck together. One of the main payoffs for the raccoon archetype is Muera, Trash Tactician. This legendary raccoon generates additional mana in our first main phase equal to the number of raccoons we control. Then if we expend at least 4 mana to cast spells we gain 3 life, and if we expend at least 8 mana we get to exile the top 2 cards from our library that we get to play until the end of our next turn. So this is really highlighting what raccoons are all about, generating mana and then spending it to cast big expensive spells so we will add all four copies into the deck. Despite it being legendary, we basically want to draw it in every game. So while a card like the Valley Mightcaller can pick up some plus one counters over time, it does not count as a raccoon for Moira's ability, so it's not necessarily the most synergistic with our raccoon game plan. It's also only a one drop, so it's not going to be the best at enabling our expend synergies. So it's going to be much better in a green-white rabbit deck, for instance, where it's more about curving out and applying a lot of pressure early, and then cards that generate multiple rabbits can also give the might caller multiple plus one counters. We don't really have those same synergies in red-green, instead we want to aim for the mid to late game where we can generate a lot of mana and cast more expensive spells, so Might Caller is not going to be good enough for what we're trying. Now what we do like are raccoons that can generate mana. Wondertail Mentor is a 2 mana 2-2, two two, saying whenever we expend 4 we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, and then it taps for both colors of mana. So this is perfect as a 2 drop in our deck that will gradually grow over time, but more importantly it's a raccoon that generates mana, so that's what we're all about. So we can add all 4 copies into the deck. Then a Bramble Familiar isn't trying to break standard this time, but it is still a fine addition to the deck as it can tap for mana, and if we top deck it later in the game we can also use the Adventure Fetch Quest to maybe expend a lot of mana and find some of our more impactful creatures. So we'll add two copies, and then to round out our two mana accelerants, I'm also going to try two copies of a Brazen Collector, a two mana 2-1 two first strike. Now if this one needs to attack in order to generate mana that we can use in our second main phase, can sometimes be a little bit awkward with our Trash Tactician making mana in our first main phase, so we can't necessarily combine both to spend all of it on one very expensive spell, but it still has decent stats and it allows us to attack while generating mana, so we can also start applying a bit of pressure. And then First Strike also combines very well with any burn spells we may have, as we can combine first strike damage with a burn spell to take care of opposing creatures that may be a bit larger. Speaking of which, take out a trash is a great removal option that will help against aggro while still giving us a way to smooth out our draws if we control a raccoon, so we can add all four copies to the deck. Now our 2 drop slot is pretty much at capacity, so we will be looking to fill out the rest of our curve. So we are leaving out the Keen-Eyed Curator, another decent 2-mana raccoon. Double green makes it a little harder to cast, plus the Curator doesn't really fit our main game plan of making mana and casting expensive spells. Also spending mana on the activated ability does not contribute towards expend. We actually need to cast spells in order to fulfill the expend mechanic, so activating abilities is not one of those ways to do it. So with our eye on the 3-drop slots we see Scrap Shooter as a very main deckable disenchant effect if we're willing to gift the opponent another card in return. Seems fair enough considering we also get a 4-4 with reach. This can also maybe trade for an opposing slick shot show off out of the red aggro decks which are quite popular while also being a great card against the more controlling Boros tokens decks which have a lot of artifacts and enchantments worth taking out. 
So we'll add all four copies of Scram Shooter into the deck, which is now starting to take shape, but we are still missing some more expensive cards to spend all our mana on. These cards don't necessarily have to be raccoons, since we don't see many expensive raccoons in the first place. Instead, we would like to see some impactful 4 and 5 mana cards that we can ramp into with our earlier raccoons. And it's also a good idea to look for multicolored options, since the multicolored cards are often better than their monocolored counterparts. So we want to look for red-green multicolored cards that cost either 4 or 5 mana, and then it goes without saying that rares and mythics are going to be better than lower rarity cards. This reveals some worthy candidates, and Hugs Grizzly Guardian caught my attention as a card we can potentially cast for 4 mana when needed as a 5-5 Trampler, but if we have additional mana available, we can now exile the top X cards of our library, and then we get to cast those until the end of our next turn. Hugs also lets us play an additional land each turn, so we can immediately play one of those lands from exile potentially, and since we are casting a more expensive spell this way, it also contributes more towards the expense mechanic, so if we cast Hugs for X equals 4, we now get to expend 8, which will trigger Mara's ability, to once again exile the top two cards of our library that we get to play until the end of our next turn. And by chaining those together and having cards available to cast on our following turn, it also becomes easier to keep expending eight every turn to keep the cards flowing. So we will add two copies of Hugs into the deck. It is still legendary and we don't necessarily want to draw multiples, but it is a great way to spend excess mana. So given how well Hugs and that type of effect plays in this archetype, we can maybe look for additional monocolored cards that also allow us to play cards from exile. So we'll search for play and exile, and we immediately come across some powerful 5-mana dragons, Bonehorde Dracosaur and Dragonhawk Fates Tempest. So let's have a look at those. Bonehorde Dracosaur, a 5-5 with flying and first strike, saying at the beginning of our upkeep, exile the top two cards of our library. We can play them this turn. If we exile a land card this way, we get to make a 3-1 red dinosaur creature token. If we exile a non-land card this way, we get to create a treasure token, and we could potentially make both. So the Dracosaur not only a great threat, first strike makes it a great blocker in the face of an opposing slick shot show-off, and then it can also provide additional card advantage, which will also help us expand spend 8 once again to maybe enable our trash tactician. So the Dracosaur seems perfect for the deck. Now let's have a look at Dragonhawk Fates Tempest. This is a 5 mana 5-5 five five flyer, so it does not have first strike and it's also legendary, so we cannot have more than one in play at the same time. But whenever Dragonhawk enters or attacks, so it does provide immediate value, unlike the Dracosaur, which we need to untap with first. We now get to exile the top X cards of our library, where X is the number of creatures we control with power 4 or greater. So it also counts itself, but gets even better if we have a developed board and we now get to play those cards until our next end step and at the beginning of our next end step it deals two damage to each opponent for each of those cards that are still exiled so the turn we play dragon hawk we're unlikely to have a lot of leftover mana to cast additional spells so now we at least get some additional damage out of it and of course the more cards we exile the more damage we will get out of dragon hawk so both Dragonhawk and Dracosaur are great. Since I only own two copies of a Dragonhawk, I'm just going to go with two copies and then fill it out with three copies of Bonehorde Dracosaur. Now, don't worry about following exactly what we do here. Work with what you have and create your own little masterpieces as long as the cards you decide to add contribute towards our main game plan. That's all that really matters. Now that we've mostly taken care of the top end of our curve, I want to make sure we're not neglecting the 1-drop slot, since given how aggressive the best of 1 meta is shaping up to be, I want to add a cheaper removal spell that we can cast on turn 1 when needed, and as a way to maybe fill out our curve if we happen to have a spare mana. This way if we cast a 3-drop and a 1-mana removal spell on a later turn, we still get to expend 4 and maybe gain additional life with our tactician, or get a plus 1 counter on the mentor. And as we've discussed last week, a great removal spell in standard right now if you're playing red is Torch the Tower, which will exile an opposing creature after taking care of it, so that's a way to prevent creatures like Heartfire Hero and Cacophony Scam from triggering, and who knows, maybe we'll get another funny clip out of it. So we'll add all four copies of Torch the Tower into the deck, plus we might have the occasional token from Bonehorde Dracosaur to enable Bargain, so we can deal three damage and scry one as well. So that's another nice synergy to keep in mind. 
Now once again, looking at the curve, I think we want to add a couple more 4-drops as something we can maybe play on turn 3 after ramping into it with our many 2-mana accelerants. So let's look for additional 4-drops, and then ideally we want that creature to have power 4 or greater. That way we have more creatures that can enable Dragonhawk if we get it down, and have that be more effective. So searching power 4 or greater is very simple, power equals or greater than 4 and that will automatically find creatures. And then maybe given how aggressive the current best of one meta is, we also want our four drop to gain us some life. So if we add that into the mix, we're left with Obstinate Baloth as our only option for mana 4-4. Four, four. When it enters, we gain four life. Already decent, but the additional ability here against the black discard decks is great. If a spell or ability an opponent controls causes us to discard Obstinate Baloth, we can put it on the battlefield instead of putting it into our graveyard. So if our opponent opens up with a turn 1 discard spell, or maybe a turn 3 Liliana, which pluses, we can now put an Obstinate Baloth into play for free. So we'll add two copies into the deck. Normally, Obstinate Baloth is more of a sideboard card against burn decks and discard decks, but given that both of those are quite popular at the moment, I don't mind having a few in the main deck. Now, if we don't care about the life gain part, there's still plenty of other options at 4 mana, especially in the multicolored section. There's the Cactus Folk Sure Shot, which is a 4-4 with Reach and Ward 2, pretty good against the uh, Slick Shot once again. And at the beginning of combat on our turn, other creatures we control with power 4 or greater gain Trample and Haste until end of turn, so it can also be very synergistic with Dragonhawk and the Dracosaur, so that would be another card worth considering. And then the Quake Mole, another very aggressive option as an 8-4 that will discourage the opponent from blocking it, otherwise we get an additional combat phase, so that can also be a pretty good 4-drop for this archetype. Now we're getting close to 60 cards, but maybe it's time we go back to have a look at our raccoons that we maybe ignored earlier. And with T, raccoon will be left with all creatures that have the raccoon type. So just keep in mind this will filter out any other non-raccoon creatures that may refer to raccoons, but in this case we're okay with that. And then we can zoom out and we come across the Bramble Guard Veteran, 3-mana, uh, 3-4, three three, so pretty decent blocker against Red Aggro. And then whenever we expend 4 Raccoons, we control get plus one plus one and gain Vigilance until end of turn. So that can be a way for us to apply a bit of pressure while still keeping our creatures back so we don't get run over by opposing aggro decks, for instance. And then by giving the Veteran plus one plus one, it turns into a 4-powered creature, which will also synergize quite well with our Dragonhawk. So I don't mind adding two copies of the Veteran here. And another potential consideration is the Byway Barter, 3-mana three 3-3 mana, three, three with Menace, since whenever we expend 4 we may discard our hand if we do draw two cards. Since we're often exiling cards from the top of our deck as a form of card advantage, our hand is more likely to be empty, so we can discard it to draw two cards, so that can be another nice way to refuel, but we're going with the Veteran instead. And then we've got one card left we can add into the deck, since I think 24 lands is acceptable given how many accelerants we have as well, so we don't need a ton of extra lands necessarily, even though it might synergize with hugs, letting us play an additional land each turn, which is also good to keep in mind. But uh, what about another disenchant effect, and maybe something that can also draw additional cards? So yeah, how about something that does both? With Season of Gathering, we can not only give us additional plus one counters and trample, can also destroy all artifacts and enchantments, of which we don't have any, and then finally can also draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures we control, so that can be another nice source of card advantage. So we'll add exactly one Season of Gathering to spice things up, another decent card against a Boros Tokens deck, as we can potentially destroy both artifacts and enchantments. So now our spells are taken care of, but the mana base still has a lot of options available. So having a look at multicolored land options, we want to go with four copies of Copper Lang Gorge, and then four copies of Kerpluzen Forest as kind of necessary mana fixing in a two-color deck and their drawbacks are pretty minimal, all things considered. And then I'm also a fan of two copies of Restless Ridgeline, does enter tapped, but since we don't have a ton of one-mana plays in this deck, playing this tapped on turn one will give us a nice tool in the late game, turning this into a creature land that can also maybe pump up additional creatures, which can then also maybe synergize with a Dragonhawk. If we resolve the plus two plus O trigger before Dragonhawk resolves, we might end up with an additional four-powered creature and one additional card in exile to deal more damage, so that can also add up. 
And then of course, since we are a raccoon deck, we also have some lands that reference raccoons. Rockface Village to give our creatures one extra power and haste until end of turn. And then Oak Hollow Village can give us a plus one counter on each raccoon that entered the battlefield this turn. So both of these are quite valuable. Now we do have to keep in mind that these don't make colored mana to cast non-creature spells. So I won't be able to use my Rockface Village to cast a turn one Torch the Tower for instance. So we do have to make sure we have enough actual red sources to cast an early Torch the Tower or maybe a turn to take out the trash. And that number is going to be around 13 to 14 red sources. So if we don't count Ridgeline, since it doesn't cast a turn one Torture Tower, we have four Copper Line Gorge, four Forest, and then five Mountains, giving us 13 red mana sources for a turn one Torture Tower. 14 would be ideal, but 13 is still manageable, since we don't always have to cast Torture Tower on turn one, especially for on the play, we're less likely to use it right away. So I'm happy with 13 red sources, leaving us with two copies of Rockface Village. Now we don't necessarily have that same restriction for Oak Hollow Village, since almost all of the green spells in our deck are creatures that we can cast using the village. But if we want to activate the village, we still need an additional green source that's not an Oak Hollow Village. We also need green mana to activate our Restless Ridge line that's not Oak Hollow Village. So I think two copies is reasonable. We're also less likely to activate it than the Rockface Village, since giving haste is usually more relevant than getting one additional plus one counter but it's still good to think about and it does provide a little bit of extra value for those grindier matchups which we can maybe expect to see more often now that maybe decks are starting to pack more removal to fight opposing aggro decks the meta game might shift to be a little bit slower with more mid-range and control decks where all these utility lands will come in handy and then speaking of utility lands, if we expect to face some control decks with counter spells, since we have lots of raccoons in our deck, why not play a few copies of Cavern of Souls? Can either name a raccoon, sometimes we want to name dragon to make our five mana dragons uncounterable, and we can also name a warrior as a way to make hugs uncounterable, and then both a Bramble Guard veteran and a Muera are also warriors, so it does have a little bit of overlap there as well. So I'll add two copies of Cavern of Souls in favor of a couple of forests, which is another reason not to go overboard with the Oak Hollow Village to make sure we have enough other green sources available. So yeah, that's our 60 card deck. Now we still need to add a few more finishing touches. We can name our deck. Raccoons seems pretty straightforward. And we can also change our sleeve if we'd like. And I've got the perfect sleeve in mind here after scrolling a bit we come across our Hugs sleeve. And then uh, last but not least, we've got to pay tribute to the master artist Bob. We'll find our mountain and forests. So we can add three happy little trees and five tall and strong mountains. So red green raccoons are now ready for battle. Let's jump in some games and see how the deck does. Okay, we're on the play with a keepable hand. No removal, but we're on the play with some two-mana acceleration. So hopefully we can just get ahead of our opponent. And our opponent on a red-white control deck, so not a matchup where we need a lot of removal. Start with a collector. Since I'm not going to expend four next turn, and this way we get some damage in, in addition to making mana. So can attack. And yeah, I don't mind playing the Tactician to immediately give us a bigger mana boost. Doesn't get swept up by Lockdown, doesn't die to Lightning Helix. So they need maybe a Get Lost to take it out. And then next turn I could maybe play a Dracosaur already. So we get to untap, immediately make two mana. Eventually we'll have to watch out for a sweeper like Sunfall, but that's still two turns away. So yeah, I can play Dracosaur, and then second main still cast Mentor. I guess it makes more sense to play the Mentor and then the Dracosaur, in which case I should have uh, made green mana here. Otherwise the red goes to waste. So yeah, I kind of forced myself to do it a little awkwardly and play Dracosaur first. So I might miss out on the extra plus one counter now. Opponent has a get lost, not taking out Dracosaur, so they might have a different get lost. Kinda surprised they waited this long. 
I guess her opponent could have a lockdown in hand, in which case I'm better off just uh, exploring here instead of playing a mentor. And then I guess I'll diversify a little bit here. Explore onto the collector, take out the trash, doesn't seem needed. And another mentor can probably do better. All right, so we've got two decent threats. And a base eyes next. Gaining life and making fish tokens. All right, Drakosaur doing its thing. Although we can expect our opponent to have a sunfall next turn. So for now, probably just want to play things from exile instead of playing more things out of my hand. Can still use the village to pump up Collector to attack past Beza. Although it's probably just going to get chumped by a fish. But yeah, if I want to attack, I kind of have to do this. And then I can still use the treasure to play Opson Beloth. Opponent does indeed chump with a fish. That's where if we maybe had the uh, author 4 drop that can give our creatures trample, it would have been better than just gaining 4. And the yeah, opponent setting up a sunfall, which now if I just block like so, we make their token a lot smaller, so... Maybe they were better off uh, not attacking. Could have also considered just double blocking Beza. But yeah, now opponent's not going for the Sunfall anymore, so maybe they don't have it or they've got different plans. But we don't have to play into it. So start by attacking. So I can go Mentor, give it haste with a village. Don't want to attack with a ridgeline while our opponent has mana available. And then play familiar to grow the mentor some more. And attack. And then I don't think I want to play another mentor out. Alright, opponent's gonna double Helix Dracosaur, it seems. Helix and Smite. Well, at least we got our value from the Dracosaur. So now the question is, do I commit another 2-drop when Sunfall could still be in our future? I think I still kind of do. Then next turn, I guess I'll be a little bit short of animating Ridgeline and doing much else. Opponent's still at 11. Yeah, I think we chill. Just see if they have the Sunfall. If not, we can uh, maybe pump the team with Veteran next turn to attack past Beza. Right, it's going to be a lockdown instead. Also makes sense. But uh, Scrap Shooter can free our creatures next turn. So we can play it and give it haste. If I attack with a hasty collector, I could cast another 2-drop afterwards. But I think it's more important to just get in damage while we can. Have our opponent cast a different sweeper. And there's a sunfall at long last. Okay, although a scrap shooter can also take out the incubator. And then put the opponent to 1, so that every haste creature is now lethal. Yeah, kind of like that plan... So yeah, Rock Face Village putting in work. So Battlefield Forge no longer makes colored mana until they gain life. Overbrask's Forge is fine. And our opponent explodes. No removal for our creature. On to the next one. 
Okay, we're on the draw. We've got a keeper. Keep up towards the tower on turn one. Opponent's got the scamp, so that's the exact creature we're trying to remove with Torture Tower. Hoping our opponent tries to pump it up first. And then we've got a decent curve of raccoons coming up. Swiss Spear resolves. And our opponent attacks. Well, I can choose which creature to take out, since I do think I want to Torture Tower here so I can tap out for Bramble Familiar next turn. And Scamp can deal more damage on the way out and is more dangerous with a uh, fling effect from Sellsword. So I think I will take out a Scamp here. Opponent gets to keep a Swiss Spear and they are stuck on one land. So they must have kept a pretty good hand with lots of pump spells if they were willing to risk it on a one lander. So their hand is all spells. They did find a second land so now they can unleash two pump spells. So definitely not blocking. Opponent maybe plotting a slick shot, yep. So that could certainly kill us next turn. Scrap Shooter does have reach, so it's a way to potentially get in front of it. I guess with two lands we're unlikely to die, but if they hit a third land it could be bad. So there's certainly an argument for just playing the Scrap Shooter, and then next turn Dracosaur can be played if Familiar survives. I still kind of like playing the Tactician here though. And then I could get in for two, but let's just play defense. Maybe discourage an attack. Opponent does play the slick shot, attacks all out, so still don't think I want to block. And then next turn we could gain some life back as well. Alright, opponent tapping out for a blazing crescendo. Does hit a land, so they can still play that second main. And they have to have a soul sword. They could put me to one here, but it's gonna be a scamp instead. Okay, so make some mana. And then I can play a Dracosaur. And gaining three life. And pass a turn. So this is a creature that needs to stabilize us. First strike pretty good at maybe blocking a slick shot now. It's gonna be a challenger next. And we get to untap, perfect. So we're exactly where we want to be. And towards the tower can also be bargained here with a treasure token. So we should be in decent shape now. Probably didn't want to tap my forest there. I can always uh, take a damage to cast another scrap shooter with a Bramble Familiar. Keep the treasure for bargain. And make sure to keep Redman available for torch. So yeah, the auto tapper is a little finicky here. Could also just activate the village to start attacking with a scrap shooter. But I don't see a reason to. We can just control the game and take over, especially once we manage to expend eight. Hardfire Hero is next. Opponent plots another slick shot, but now we've got double scrap shooter and Dracosaur to get in front of it. And how about a season of gathering? That's gonna be pretty sweet. Make a ton of mana, cast it. And we can draw cards and do this as well. And sure, let's draw seven cards. Why not? Okay, next up. Can play another Scrap Shooter. And that will also trigger our Tactician. And uh, could pass a turn now with two removal spells available. And Drakosaur is vigilant, so can attack. Could have also pumped a Scrap Shooter, but wanted to draw the extra card there. Opponent falls to 13. And next turn it should be trivial to end things. So discard a tap land, don't need all the tacticians anymore. Could have also just cast some removal spells, so I don't have to discard to hand size as much. But we'll wait for the opponent to make their move. And then we can respond accordingly. Next turn can also pump the team with our veteran. So we're just playing it extra safe here, respecting the red deck. But next turn we can attack all out with Vigilance. Polonius Rage. Can respond with Torture Tower. 
so nothing triggers. And our opponent explodes. Awesome. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw. We've got a keepable hand, no removal, so against aggro we might fall behind. But our opponent with a turn one swamp. So for now, play our mountain. Next turn, maybe try mentor first. Cavern to make our raccoons uncounterable. And opponent with a cruel claws heist. Can now steal one of our cards that they get to cast. Might go for my tactician. Got multiple two drops to choose from, so they can't really throw off our curve too much. And eventually a season of gathering could be good in the grindier matchup. So we'll see. Ends up taking our uh, veteran. Was not expecting that. For now, play Copperline Gorge in case we draw more of them. And yeah, we'll give Mentor a try. There's a chance our opponent plays something like a Preacher, which can block Collector profitably. So then I wouldn't be able to make mana with it. And there's a chance we can maybe expend four to already put a counter on it. Alright, opponent with a uh, Jace. Can shrink down our Mentor. And yeah, I'm not opposed to going Collector times two here to get a plus one counter. If I play Tactician, there's a decent chance it gets removed. Could also give something Haste with a Village, which is a way to pressure Jace. Uh, let's see if I go Collector, give it Haste. One mana left doesn't really do much. But uh, it is an option. Hit Jace for three. Have an extra creature in play. Yeah, maybe that's actually better. Would have been perfect if we also had a torch the tower to finish off Jace. So that's going to plus on the collector. And our opponent plays veteran as a blocker. Fair enough. So they can now try to protect Jace. We have a couple options. If collector attacks, I technically have the mana to cast a season of gathering. Although well, it would be second main phase. So maybe we just build up our board this turn. And go Tactician plus Collector, gain some life. And then... Hope there's no Sweeper incoming. And then next turn we can Season of Gathering. Now our opponent can cut down after shrinking it down with Jace. That's a pretty neat interaction. Drew a land. So I can still cast Season of Gathering. And hope it doesn't get countered, pretty much. We'll name Dragon here for future turns. And then we want to draw and get some plus one counters going. So, drawing four is probably good enough already. Can make one four-powered collector. And then if I attack with both, I can still actually take out the trash. To finish off Veteran after first strike. So we'll let first strike damage happen. And then now take out the trash. I'm discarding a land. Alright, not a bad turn. Got a Torch of Tower now as well. And we still have our village to give creatures haste. Pretty nice against control. Opponent's got another Jace. I'll take note of all your failures. Do you have to watch out for five mana sweepers next turn? There is the uh, cover up, which they could easily have. So we want to try and take out Jace without necessarily overextending here. Playing hugs is a way to generate a bit of value for next turn while still adding something to the board. If I give something haste, can I take my opponent out? Yeah, we have 10, 15 damage. Not quite lethal, but we're getting close. I guess if I go for hasty scrap shooter and our opponent wipes the board, next turn they're dead to another hasty raccoon. So that might actually be good enough. Yeah, 
But yeah, the alternative would be to attack and then sink all that additional mana into hugs to uh, exile additional cards. But let's just go face. And then I guess if I torch the tower Jace here, we expend four to get an extra plus one counter. So that seems worthwhile. Bone falls to one. And uh, don't think I need to play Mentor since our opponent already needs a board wipe. And our opponent explodes. Awesome. So yeah, Raccoon's beating blue-black control. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play. We do not have any early accelerants. So it is kind of a clunky hand in a way. No removal either. So we're basically hoping our opponent makes us discard our obstinate Bailoth. So we can put that in play. Yeah, this one feels a little clunky, but I'll still try it since we're on the play. Makes up for our hand being a little slow. Turn one swamp, is it gonna happen? Ah, negotiation makes us exile, so that doesn't trigger the Bailoth. Okay, in that case, maybe get rid of a veteran. I should probably get used to the idea of giving up my 5 drops, since we may not get to 5 mana before they make me discard again. Alright, now we get a free Bailoth. Mission accomplished. And Scrapshooter could blow up the talents. Although then the opponent does get to draw an extra card. Long term, that may still be worth it. Since this might end up being a grindier matchup. And then next turn at the very least I can activate a village to pump up my raccoon. Well, I'm glad we got some value off our obstinate Bailoth at least. Deep Cavern Bat sees two dragons, takes one of them. And we draw a third. Well, those are all three. And get in for nine damage. And hope to draw an untapped land for Dracosaur next turn. And our opponent explodes. Yeah, Hobsonet Bailoth claims another victim. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play. We've got a reasonable hand, although I guess now that I look at it, we don't actually get to cast Take Out to Trash with our village. So, could be behind against aggro, and then we don't have any ramp to get to our 5 drops. So maybe this is still a mulligan. And this is a bit better. Can actually torch the tower on one, collector on two, and then maybe veteran can go. Tactician can ramp towards our dragon hawk, opponent red white, so maybe another Boros tokens deck. Sure. They've got a carrot cake. So we can attack, play Tactician, and now maybe just play Tap Land. So next turn we will get two mana from the ability, unless they've got a Get Lost here. Although we would still get to play Dragon Hawk with a mana from our Collector at that point. It's going to be a Caretaker's Talent for card advantage. Okay. So make some mana, and we can play a Dragon Hawk, keeping up towards the tower potentially. And Veteran's gonna go to waste. Okay, so attack. Still two turns away from a potential Sunfall. So that's the card to beat here. We've got a ridge line as an extra threat. 
For now, Carrot Cake draws off Caretaker's talents. And then I imagine they're just gonna sacrifice it in my turn to once again draw and gain some life. So I don't know if there's a point in using Torture Tower on their token here. Maybe it's still fine. Since we're not gonna find many better targets. And a Dracosaur is not banned, although don't want to overextend into a Sunfall necessarily. Although if I cast it, I do get an extra four-powered creature for Dragonhawk. Could also just uh, animate the ridge line now and then see if they Sunfall me next turn. And then I have to decide between pumping up one of my raccoons with the village or just... Uh, Seeing what we find with Dragonhawk, if I find a 2-drop I can maybe still cast it. Although that would also be into a potential Sunfall. So I think I'm okay just pumping. Attack. And then Ridgeline wants to target the Dragonhawk, so they cannot prevent more damage on the ground with her 1-1 one -one Rabbit. Opponent draws, so yeah. Found a scrap shooter, but unable to cast it, otherwise it would have been a decent answer to the talent. So they're at three, but let's see if they have a sunfall. I guess if they do, they still die to the ridge line, so that's fine. Spot removal for Dragonhawk, plus something else could maybe do it. And our opponent explodes. Awesome. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play. We've got a keepable hand, although it is missing a two mana play. So no early removal and no raccoon to power up our tactician. But tactician could still ramp out a turn four Dragonhawk. Opponent's got to the rest, which will miss. But it does mean our opponent's on maybe a discard deck. So we're just hoping to draw our obstinate Baloth again. For now, play a land and pass. And there's a deep cavern bat. Can take our tactician. So we'll just play a veteran. The ridge line's also important to eventually pressure a Liliana if that shows up. Well, our draw hasn't really developed, just picked up some lands. And now Bronco from the opponents. And a Torture Tower. Alright, so I can take out the bat and play my Tactician. Which also allows me to attack with Vigilance. I'll name Raccoon. Probably should just play the Forest, which is better at activating my Villages. So that was a pretty nice top deck. We're in a position to play Dragonhawk while also triggering Veteran to grow the team. And have another four-powered creature for Dragonhawk. Shieldred's going to be a bit of a speed bump. So play Dragonhawk and then I guess we'll see what we find. Alright, can still play Brazen Collector. Maybe should have considered keeping the village untapped so I could pump Veteran past Shieldred. But uh, this will work out. So play Village. Play Collector. No attacks, but still deal some damage with our Dragonhawk. Can it stick around for another turn? Opponent just sacking the draw spits to draw. Gains two with Shieldred, but uh, opponents may be desperate to find removal for Dragonhawk. Get to untap, make a ton of mana. And we can take out the trash on the Bronco, or we could wait to use it on Shieldred. Might be fine to actually animate the ridge line at this point. And then we'll still have Carpluzen Forest to cast Take Out the Trash. Go to attackers. 
and then make sure the ridge line resolves before Dragonhawk. And pump, I want to say, maybe a Dragonhawk itself. Opponent's likely to block my tactician here. And we found a mountain. So that happens. So take out the trash will trigger shield an additional time, but yeah, that's acceptable. Maybe it was still worth casting it before damage happened in case we found another instant to expand and gain life with our tactician, but uh, go to our main phase and then I could still cast a Bramble Familiar. Do we expect a Sweeper next turn? If they cast a Gixus Command, our opponent still dies because it would take two damage from Dragonhawk at two, so then just attacking with our creature land once again would do it. And our opponent explodes. Awesome, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play. Our hand seems acceptable. Could of course fall behind if we don't hit our land drops, and if they remove Mentor, I'm not going to be able to cast my spells. But uh, Mentor into Tactician can maybe help ramp out our 5 mana dragons. Put on the green-white rabbits with turn 1 Mightcaller. A very scary card, especially if they can make some tokens. Yeah, I think the rabbit matchup is going to be unfavorable most of the time, unless we have the right interaction early to take care of cards like Mightcaller. But we'll see. Being on the play, also a very big advantage in a matchup that's all about board presence. Opponent actually Naya Callers, so it might not be a simple rabbit deck. And that's uh, still going to be a mentor for now. So yeah, that one also gets bigger the more creatures they have. Opponent not offering the trade. Got to play the Tactician and then hope to untap with it. So we'll have 5 mana, enough for Dracosaur or Dragonhawk. So the card we don't want to see is hop to it, making three 1-1 one, one rabbits. Evangelist gets pretty close. The bat token does not grow the might caller. It does synergize with the quest caller, however, which also pumps bats. So that's why they maybe made the mistake of attacking here. All right, tactician can make two mana. And then this can name dragon or could also go for Warrior, making it easier to cast Hugs. There's a few other Warriors in the deck, not the ones we have right now. And then, kind of liking the Dracosaur here. So yeah, that attack with uh, Mightcaller definitely gives us a chance. Opponent's got another one. And the Recruit with Offspring. So Mentor, a 6-6 six, six Trampler, can attack. I'm gonna have to take it there. Although we should be able to gain some life back with a Tactician. Found Dragonhawk in Exile. Don't mind if I do. And then Torture Tower, a pretty clean answer to an Evangelist, if that's what we want to try and remove. It will trigger the Recruit, however, giving them two more plus one counters. So there is a serious drawback to it as well. But uh, let's start by casting Dragonhawk. Probably playing my land out, keeping Torture Tower available without a treasure. Find a bunch more cards. All right, what do we think? Do I Torture Tower to remove a creature, give them two plus one counters? Or do we just try and put more creatures on the battlefield here? to try and just block, which is also reasonable. Dragonhawk is going to deal 6 damage here, so you can also maybe look at the opponent's life total, although I don't think we're in a position to necessarily attack. So with that said, yeah, I don't think I'm attacking, but I will torture tower the Evangelist after all. Triggering the recruits. And then I'll just pass it back. Putin falls to 14. If Dragonhawk trades, we've got another one. 
although attacking with it could be a way of dealing a bunch more damage. So yeah, if they don't force us to make any jump blocks here, I'll be happy. Quest Caller, as we said, pumping rabbits as well as bats. And a Warren Guard, good with tokens. So they've got an 8-8 Mentor, 7-7 Might Caller. Should be able to survive, but I will have to block at least one creature. Yeah, I guess if the Dracosaur dies, it's not a disaster. So I could maybe double block the Might Caller with Dracosaur and Tactician. And then opponent gets to take out one of the two. Take eight. Next turn Dragonhawk attacks. Triggers. Can play another one. And then just burn them out that way. Seems fine. Double blocking the Mentor with a 5-5 five, five and a 4-4 four, four is also totally reasonable. Could in fact double block now as well. Then they take out Dragonhawk. We don't have guaranteed lethal, although we also don't take any damage and we can still probably take over. So there's a few ways to play this, but I feel like we can close it out next turn. With just village untapped, there's no instant we need to worry about either. Alright, so make some mana. Can play a scrap shooter and then still cast a second main dragon hog just to get another four powered creature on the battlefield. Dragon hog attacks. I guess they can jump with a bat token here to soak up five damage. So that's six damage in exile basically. But yeah, opponent takes it, not too surprising. And then play another dragon hog. All right, so we got to see our red-green raccoons in action. And yeah, this deck played out a lot better than expected. Just ramping out various five-mana dragons seems to be a solid strategy. We've got enough things going on that we can potentially still beat the more controlling decks like red-white tokens, especially with our utility lands. Turning our lands into creatures or giving our raccoons haste is a good way to recover from a sweeper effect. So yeah, don't underestimate the raccoons in the current standard. Now, of course, there are still decks that can go over the top of our strategy, thinking of anything with Atraxa in it, since a 7-powered lifelinker is pretty good against a red-green beatdown deck, and then the card advantage from Atraxa will help the opponent stabilize. So that's definitely a card we don't want to see as a raccoon deck. But against aggro, we should have enough tools, even though there will be draws where our opponent just uh, overwhelms us too quickly when we don't have the early interaction available. So so by no means an unbeatable deck, but I do like where it ended up. So that'll do it for today's gameplay. Wanna thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day.